So the title of this talk is not the spirit of creativity, but rather the scientific spirit. But before that, I'd like to thank you for your presence and for your attention. Two things that are very different from each other. In class, we've always demanded attention, but we've never known how to have presence. That's how we've been educated. That's why we need authorities due to the lack of presence. In talking about presence, I would like to thank everyone. I see you all here before me, but I also want to thank the presence of two people who are invisible. And those are Anna and Tania, our interpreters, who are in their box there. They're going bright red as I speak. Duality means that we don't understand each other. There's many languages and we need interpreters, see? In fact, Juan Mascaro is an interpreter between cultures, as we saw yesterday. Today we're going to talk about a very special interpreter, the scientific spirit. It is an interpreter. And who does this interpreter have to interpret between? Well, between our ego and our heart, our essence. Give it whichever name you will, but our wisdom, finally. The scientific spirit is an interpreter so that the ego can translate the wisdom of our essence. Our essence speaks a language that due to our education, our ego cannot understand. It's opaque, it's as if it spoke Russian. So it needs an interpreter. Because notice that the girls, they don't translate, they interpret. They take the voice and the feeling that I have, that I put into my, into my words, and they do it too. See, if I touch my ear, will they touch their ear? Yes, they even move to interpret the meaning. This interpreter is key for the change in paradigm, because if we don't understand our own wisdom, then we just don't recognize it. And this can't be. It means we lose our wisdom. So the scientific spirit, amongst its virtues, has the following. That it substitutes the authorities for the scientific or religious. If you go to your own wisdom, you don't need scientific authorities nor religious authorities. To educate, empowering is to educate without authorities from the center of each person. Fritjof spoke earlier about growth, so did Vandana, about growing like a seed from inside towards the outside, from within to without. We have been educated to demand this from the powerful, but would, would, do we do this? Do we grow from within towards the outside, or do we consume ourselves fighting the powerful? It is one thing to have force, another thing is to have power. Force, this is the third law of Newton, opposes to another force. This is duality. To have power is to be aligned, that what you think, feel and do is together. And this is not possible if you don't recognize yourself in the other. If you don't recognize yourself in your enemy, it's impossible otherwise. Because what you're doing at the end of the day is fighting yourself. And that's what power comes from. When you work on this and understand this, what happens is that you become invisible to the powerful because they no longer see you, because they're playing chess and you've stopped playing. There's only one way to not lose when you're playing a game like chess, is to not play. That's right, my friends. Because if you play, the rules of duality say, okay, you're very good at chess, so you're going to win 90% of the time, but you're going to lose one time out of 10 and you'll get really angry. And the better you are as a player, the more angry you will be. So it's about coming out of this duality game. The scientific spirit and the wisdom of the ages are very powerful tools because we don't recognize the enemy within. Therefore, the battle never ends. If you never recognize the enemy within you, you're always projecting it on someone else and you get exhausted. You get rid of one powerful entity, another one substitutes it. The one that 
first of all fought with great ideals against the powerful and took over, will then be corrupted by the same thing. This is repeated in the history books because there has not been that growth from within, of that seed within. We have to grow from within. And the only people who can do this is the educators who feel this. Self-knowledge cannot be imposed. It comes from within. So it's about making your classes develop that inner knowledge, respecting the rhythm of growth of that student. We're no one to judge somebody else's rhythm. So this scientific spirit that takes us out of this pressure of authorities, whether it's political, religious, any authority you want to put there, it comes to help us so that we may come out of the box of isms that Satish was talking about. In my film, Entre Maestros, Amongst Teachers, there's a box in the room. It's called the box of thoughts. It's full of stickers. On those stickers, guess what it says? Isms, capitalism, socialism, communism, nationalism, egoism. What do they all have in common? That we give our authority sorry, our identity over to them. Why do we lose? Because we give our identity to a belief, because our ego is scared. We become groups like herds, because we feel safe in the herd. If you stop judging, you realize that the enemy also has the right to have their own groups. That's the scientific spirit. It's a scientific look that's objective, but also spiritual. So Satish was saying, how do we join science and spirituality? Well, with the scientific spirit. There's the key. We talk about science with conscience. That is the scientific spirit. It's even deeper. So notice something. We're taught to think. We teach ourselves. Would you see my education is coming in there as if there was someone outside guilty for educating me? No, we educate ourselves in that paradigm to think within these boxes, which are beliefs. Scientific theories, religions are boxes to think within. We cannot think without these boxes. It's impossible because our thoughts would just spread out. We would not be able to create a culture. We need boxes. But the scientific spirit brings us a very powerful tool. Our thoughts have a level of subtlety, and they become inframed in the box that we think within. But the scientific spirit is even more subtle. So the scientific spirit that is within us comes out of the box and is able to see from outside which box we're thinking from without criticizing. It's able to see which is the ism that we're thinking from. That's what we need to teach in class, to have debates in which we're not judging each other, but just looking at which box is our colleague, our classmates, thinking from. That's what we do in the film Entre Maestros. Because to know how to think is vital. If you are coming up against someone, if you don't know which box you're thinking from and which box your enemy is thinking from, you're never going to agree never going to be able to understand each other. The scientific spirit, you must feel it in your heart. Feel it in your heart. It's a science that does not let itself be trapped within the boxes of thought, but that uses them. We need those boxes. The new paradigm are new boxes that have doors so that our mind, guided by the scientific spirit, can come outside and look at the boxes of others. So I go into the box of the person that thinks differently to me, that I'm opposing, and I go there as if it was the home of a friend. And if at my friend's home the habit is to leave the shoes at the door, that's what I do. I leave my shoes at the door when I go into that box because my identity is safe. It doesn't depend on that box. This is key. Duality has power because we don't have our own identity. We have delegated it into countries, ideas, beliefs. There cannot be a united humanity while we don't recover our own identity. And this, my friends, can only be done one by one. And the way of increasing the speed of this is through education. A teacher who is awake can wake up the students that feel that way without imposing it. Thank you.
So this scientific spirit for me is the inner motor driving force that will take us to the new paradigm. One can live this new paradigm like a new belief and become trapped in that box. You can give lessons about the new paradigm as much as you want, but if you have not recovered your identity, you won't be understanding the new paradigm. You will be repeating the same pattern, a box. Another very important thing, when we're struggling in duality against someone, we need to be aware that we're angry because our identity is in danger. This is very important. The thing that we're most fearful of is losing our identity. So we identify with everything except our own power. Whoever goes into their own power doesn't want to subject anyone. What could be better as an education to finish with the powerful or the strong, the oppressors? What could be best than an education that serves both the children of the rich as well as the children of the poor? So a teacher who is awake can be in a public or private education, in a poor school, in a rich school. Both of them are doing their job because they're not enemies. They're not. It's our beliefs that make us see others as enemies because we feel our points of support are in danger. So to educate empowering is to go back to your center, to feel beyond your religion, your country, etc. And now comes the funny part. What's the best way of serving your culture and your country is to be free because only that way that culture will really grow. See that? By not repeating the same mistakes, the same values. Notice where we are. In a church. Interesting, no? The scientific spirit cannot remain trapped amongst stones. I started to awaken with the Jesuit. So see, we mustn't judge. Anthony de Mello, some of you may know him. I used to read book after book and I went into a bookshop and I went into a Catholic bookshop in Barcelona. I thought, yes, let's see what's in here. Something guided me and I took a book by Anthony de Mello and the first page it said the following. The enemy of spirituality is religion. The enemy of spirituality is religion. I looked at the cover of the book and said, it says Jesuit here. Salterrae is a, a publishing company. It belongs to the church. What does this mean? It means don't judge someone because they're within an institution, because it's the level of consciousness that matters. So once Anthony Mello was asked, so you, thinking this way, what are you doing inside the church? And he said, I was born in India, and I was educated in a Catholic region, and the church was my mother, is my mother, and when your mother is sick, you must not abandon her. So this is a movement from the heart, you see. If you think that your enemy is ill or sick, which is also a judgment, you must not abandon him or her. This is looking at it from the heart. That's the point we need to reach. The struggle of the heart has no enemies. All words have octaves. It's what I call the octaves of words, like music, like musical notes. So there's certain octaves, and we can elevate those octaves. So the note A has different octaves and words is the same. Sometimes we argue because we're interpreting them from different octaves. The word purity in duality means that one is pure and the other one is not, impure. You're born with the original sin. There you go. So we're classifying people pure, impure. But we can elevate the octave of the word purity. We can go zhun, up to the heart, same word. We're not going to fight the other octave. They're all part of the keys of the piano. We're not going to fight them. But when we elevate the octave of the word, what we see is that what is important is the pure look, pure vision. I'm not judging the other or myself. So I'm in my power. I'm in an elevated octave of the word purity. I am in the scientific spirit. I can understand the other without judging. So to live in the scientific spirit is to understand the other without judging. The word science is very appropriate, and you will see why.
Because no scientist, when studying the force of gravity, would say, damn the force of gravity. A scientist won't judge the force of gravity. What he or she wants to know is how it works. So, if you have a confrontation with somebody, find out how they work, where are they thinking from. That's the scientific spirit. It's science. Because you will be able to develop certain tools. I develop in my book the tool of theory of characters. I identify my students as different characters so that I can stop judging them. So I observe them, I classify, and then I take it away. Take away the labels. This is very useful. There are different tools, not only in my own way of working to educate empowering, but also in many other theories and methodologies. I recommend that you re-educate yourself in every single subject, history, mathematics, everything. You've been educated to think in a certain box. I've seen people do a work in inner growth and do courses and their life improves very little. And the reason for that is because they've improved 20 degrees of their education but they still have another 340 to resolve. We need to re-educate ourselves in the new paradigms. And how do we recognize those new paradigms? Well, this is where the slightly more complicated thing comes along. Ideally, we should recognize it from our hearts. A good scientific theory should be should resonate from our hearts. So, for example, you've asked me how can we do our curriculum in class but do it from the heart. So, for example, if you're teaching Darwinism, you connect it with history and you see where did it come up, Darwinism? How was the society at that time? How did it see the world? What was development, developing capitalism? competition. So you see that point by point the values of Darwinism coincide with the values of that time. So it's not the truth about nature, it's about how a certain society sees nature at that time. You see? So this is not illegal for a teacher to show this to their students. The teacher is explaining Darwinism but is changing the context. It's about amplifying the box. You say, okay, I have to teach this box. Okay, but where does that box fit into and teach that wider context? This amplifies the mind of the students without struggle. Expansion without struggling. To, in order to expand, we need to recognize. We need to recognize in our heart duality. We need to recognize in our heart the church. We need to recognize in our heart our enemy. We will only be powerful before our enemy if we recognize him or her from the heart. Otherwise, we will win a battle, but we will lose the next one. And this is the game that I call duality land. In order not to judge, we need to go into our inner child. You catch yourself judging and you get angry. You think, ah, oh, the scientific spirit says I shouldn't be judging. So how do you resolve this? Well, you look at it as a game. If you see duality as something that is squashing us, that is our enemy, then we're in duality. Duality land. People are fighting because they're playing the duality game without their egos even noticing. This is the wisdom of the ages. Seeing it as a child, as a game, you're aware that you can come out of the game. But if you don't use your inner child, you don't recognize you're in a game, you don't know you can get out of it, and you get all tangled up, trapped in duality. To combat duality is to stay in duality. We need to recognize duality as a game. Your surrounding is playing that game. You're playing playing that game, but you're aware of it. You're aware that it's a game. And as the sentence I mentioned the other day of Oliver Holmes says, the mature person knows the rules, but the elder person knows the exceptions. When you see duality as a game, you will learn to see the exceptions. And while other people get trapped, you won't, because you will have recognized the rules of the game. You won't get hurt by the other. It's the rules of duality land that hurt you. The scientific spirit, to know the rules that tie us down, the boxes that we think within. There's no longer enemies. This is a scientific act. 
scientific spirit, which is also spiritual because I'm embracing the other in my heart. That's for me the new paradigm. There can be many interpretations of the new paradigm. I cannot act as an authority. The one that I feel is the scientific spirit. If there's a theory that says I'm new paradigm, but it doesn't find space in my heart, then for now I won't accept it. And this is very important, to listen to your heart. So the wisdom of the ages is very important because it helps people to structure that knowledge in order to help students and teachers, to teach teachers how to teach, give them the tools, how to begin to teach with the wisdom of the ages. You can see this change requires inner growth. So please, don't dare force anybody. Anyone who's done inner growth courses, inner development, self-development courses, you think, oh, isn't this fantastic? You sit down, your neighbor, your brother, and you say, oh, you have to do this course, even pay it for them. This is going to change your life. No, we've been educated in authorities, and we think that this is a key and that somebody holds it and that we can pass it on to somebody else. Carlos doesn't have the key. You have it. Anthony de Mello said, the prisoner has the key to his own cell and he doesn't know it. And that's it. That's the scientific spirit, is finding out where is the key, which are the boxes I'm thinking within. So now let's go back to the PowerPoint. We're going to go past a lot of these images. And I'd like this PowerPoint to be shared by Pocapoc with everyone who's here, so you can go over it later at home. Here it talks about paradigms, we'll move on from that. It touches also with something that appears here. This I will explain it. It's the difference between the scientific method that we scientists have been trained in and the scientific spirit. See the difference? I won't have time to go into this now, but whoever looks at the PowerPoint afterwards will be able to see this. The characteristics of the scientific spirit. The scientific method investigates something within a box, but it doesn't know that it's a box. Because now it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, mechanism. Oh, it's a perspective. You can look back and say, oh, look, that was mechanism. But what about our look? How do we know that the systemic view we talk about now is not just another box? The scientific spirit allows you to think within the box, the container, but it's so subtle that it comes outside of the box and examines it and looks at the limits of my vision. Imagine educating in this way. You can talk about any theory in class and you can say, let's examine the limits of this belief, of this box. Let's expand the mind, intelligence. It's incredible the power this has. The scientific method is just a set of rules in order to look at the world of nature in the way that in the West we've learned to look at it. The scientific method is of no use to a tribe in the Amazon. However, a grandfather teaching his grandchild in the Amazon about plants could be doing this from the scientific spirit. And he doesn't even know it because there's a movement of the heart. He says, listen to the plant. The plant is talking to you. See, it's very different. There's a different level of depth. So what I'm talking about is to go from the scientific method to the scientific spirit, to move on to it. Yes, this bit I need to explain. Can I please take another 10 minutes for this? Thank you. This is about those things that move. Earth, real things. Every culture educated in the new paradigm and every person having lost their real identity because it's put to the service of the beliefs of that culture, it doesn't allow people to put the culture into danger. And so what happens is cultural arrogance. Of course, you're not aware that you're culturally arrogant. Are you? Well, those of us in the West start to realize this a little bit more now that we've invaded half the world, but a tribe in the Amazon or Australia also has cultural arrogance. They also feel that their religious values are the truth. You see? So the scientific spirit 
doesn't confuse a theory with reality. It can help us to bring down the wisdom. That's what theories can do, but they're not the truth. We mustn't confuse a spiritual current that could be something that descends our own wisdom with the truth. The truth would be on the higher level and we bring it down. And the spiritual look, or however you want to call it, would be the lift. And somebody else would have a different lift or elevator to mine. And they can also be wise. It's their wisdom, you see? So let's go for this story. Do you know who transmitted that cultural arrogance? It's the educators. What a shock. You think, what, I've done this? Yes, you did, and you're still doing it. This is an incredibly brutal awakening, and you have to do really deep inner work of not judging yourself, of realizing, well, I didn't know it was like this. I'll give you an anecdote. I was in Biocultura in Barcelona, and this elderly man came. He's a French surgeon who had served in the Vietnam War very old man and he was very moved as he spoke and he started to explain his story he was serving in the American side and there was a, an illness was declared in the jungle and this was a new illness for the doctors and it led to the arms and legs uh, acquiring gangrene so he started to save lives by cutting arms and legs off people to stop this illness the American uh, army couldn't allow this because their, their soldiers were mutilated by an illness and this for morale was terrible. So they consulted with the best doctors in the world, took blood samples, invested lots of money and power and strength into this and they just couldn't find the solution. So our friend was there cutting arms and legs off the soldiers and suddenly this little light came on in his head, that wisdom. There was something, th something special in this man. And he said, just a moment, we're in the jungle. This is not our territory. What if the people here know this illness? We have prisoners. Let's ask them. So they asked the prisoners, do you know this illness that we're suffering? And they said, of course we do. And this is very easy to solve. We take this plant from the jungle, and in three days, you're fine. His eyes still watered as he told the story 40 years later. He thought he was saving lives by cutting off arms and legs. Why? Because the reality was invisible. The highest, most trained people had been trained in authorities. So other realities become invisible due to your education. So notice the power that you have as educators to reveal this to your students. Grow and amplify the vision of your students. Document yourselves with all of these things I'm talking to you about because it's really delicious. You will discover that the younger the child, the less programmed he or she is. And it becomes easier to do the same with adults or adolescents. Well, it's a lot quicker with adolescents than with adults. This is key. Cultural arrogance is a key concept. We pass it on without even wanting to. People say, oh, but this is very complicated. What you're saying is so complex. It's very complicated from the education you received because the new paradigm is much simpler. Duality needs us to get tangled in it and make things complicated. So we see things complicated because of our educational view upon things. Let's move on ahead. This is just an image. It's very interesting. The weight that education means to us. We're like a worm that in the new paradigm turns into a butterfly, but if we don't re-educate ourselves, well, we go into an inner growth course, we've taken on a little piece of this, but this is our education. Nobody is guilty of this. We have been, it was passed on to us, we pass it on, we mustn't feel guilty. You are passing it on. And this is the basis of unhappiness, because duality does not want us to be happy permanently. That's the game, otherwise there would be no confrontation. Let's continue through other images. Here, how we've been educated, imitating, imitating authority. This box says it all. This is a fabulous story. Shall I explain it? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Some of you know this story. 
How many characters, Indian characters, are appearing? Vandana's gone now, but it's amazing, isn't it? Here you have this gentleman here. I don't remember his name. And he was a computer engineer in India, and he was teaching computing to the children of rich people. Sugata Mitra, that's it, that's his name. So here you have a video. If you download this PowerPoint, you can watch the video. It turns out this man asked himself something because he was constantly being congratulated. Oh, my children are so much more intelligent now. And he suddenly thought, would poor children also become more intelligent through computing? Hmm. And he thought, well, how could I check whether poor pe children could understand computing just as well as rich people's children. But this was in the 90s. He couldn't give computers to young people. He was a, a teacher at university in Britain. So he had a great idea. He thought, okay, hole in the wall. He got inspired by the hole in the wall cash machines. And he thought, okay, what if I do one like this in New Delhi? And instead of a cash machine, what's there is a computer that's protected and that people can use and connect to the internet. So he does it, he builds it. And in India, I've been there. When you do something new, you're surrounded by children. They're all around you watching. And they're all asking, what's this, what's this? And the guy said, very clever, he said, oh, I don't know, I don't know what this is. He didn't want to influence them. So he left. He came back two months later to see what had happened. And he found that the children were using Internet and the computer. Children who were illiterate. Illiterate in their own language. And imagine in English. Well, they would have learned whatever they learned in the streets. And they asked him for a mouse that could be quicker. They said, hey, we've seen there's a faster mouse than this. So he communicates this to his bosses, and they say, this is ridiculous. Because they say, feet on the ground, you've done this in Delhi, there could have been computer engineers walking down the street helping those children. And he thought, ah, oh, yes, you could be right, okay. So he found a village 300 kilometers away from New Delhi where everyone pretty much was illiterate. He wanted to do a hole in the wall machine, but there was no wall, first problem. So he had to build a little hut and through satellite, I'm not sure how he did this, but he connected it to the internet. Same thing, he built it, came back two months later. And hey, the children in that village had learned English, they knew how to use the computer. That's where the wisdom of the ages comes in, these beautiful images, where you see an adolescent holding a child who's three or four years old looking into the screen, and the child is getting inspired. See, it's the wisdom of the ages, it's very powerful to bring the ages together. Nobody had told them they couldn't do it. Nobody had communicated to them that they couldn't do it. So our man gets really happy and says, wow, this is an incredible discovery. They learn without a teacher even. So he says, okay, let's do the test of fire on this. Let's put a biology test, of one of the most advanced tests that are done in the UK at universities. Okay, I'm going to put this biology test onto the computer. He says, well, let's see if they can solve this one. He comes back two months later, and they had got maybe four or something out of ten. So he thought, yeah, of course, it is too much to ask. But then he thought, okay, in India, the grandmothers, what they do is support the grandchildren by telling them, you can do it, you can do it. They encourage them in this way. Then. So he thought, okay, let's find a grandmother. He didn't find a grandmother, but he found a young woman who said, well, I don't know anything about this. And he said, never mind, you just come here every day and just say to the kids, yes, you can do it, you can do this. He comes back two months later, they had had gone through the test with flying colors. And this was a final university end of year test. And these were children who were illiterate. The video goes on, follows through with this, does a follow up. They find that the children speak and say, how did this influence you later on in your life? And the kid says, who's now an adult, says, well, I became uh, an, an aerospace engineer. Incredible, because the kid says, the man says, well, we discovered Google Maps, and we looked, and we saw, well, actually, our mothers are walking seven kilometers every day to get water, but actually on Google Maps, we can see there's, there's a fountain that's closer, we can walk less. And then also they thought, well, why should we carry the water? Even if it is closer, you have to work less, walk less. And we saw on the Internet you could make channels, and so between us all, we made the channels. Where are the teachers? They are the teachers. This is the essence of 
everyone being a teacher, we all have a teacher within. But our education and authorities kills that teacher. That's why we depend on the authorities. You see? Sometimes people say to me, Carlos, explain this to so-and-so. And I say, no, you explain it. See, we've been asked, we've been trained into behaving in this way. I think I've taken up my time, but I'll just take another second. I'm such a cheat. Oh, I haven't got time for this story, but there's a link on this. Some of you will know this. Maybe you know this story? No? Well, let's see what it says here. Okay, I'll explain it quickly. This man is very hard-headed. He has the scientific spirit and doesn't know it. He lives in the Austrian Siberia. Fritja will know that area. So it turns out he thought, it's very cold here, and I want to plant everything here, even cherry trees. Over 100 meters above sea level, people said, you're crazy. So he started to connect with his own wisdom to know how to do it. He didn't know anything about permaculture, for example. It's really funny. And he started, and he created a garden of Eden. He has cherries there, only they fruit in September. But who cares? He, he is having a little rest, having a, a sleep. And this is not for nothing. When you educate yourself in the new paradigm, you understand your consciousness inhabits different dimensions. And so this man, without knowing about the new paradigm, he would have a sleep in that specific place. And he says ideas would come to him after waking up. And this has a scientific basis in the new paradigm. You've connected with the other dimensions, with the ideas. I, that's how I've connected. Myself, for example, with the wisdom of the ages. That's how I got that idea. I can assure you there's so many dreams and things to develop in the new paradigm, new humanity, that are just waiting for us to have the connection. That half-sleep state that we get into, Dali, for example, would go in there into that half-sleep, half-awake state because you're more creative there. You receive wisdom that goes beyond the ego. That's where the ideas come from. Another fascinating thing he would do was about pumpkins. He didn't know about permaculture, but pumpkins need heat. So he, would, so somebody said, get those stones away from here. And he thought, no, 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 because stones conserve the heat. And that's how he got the the pumpkins to grow. In the documentary, you can see huge pumpkins he's holding. We, in our classes, also want to get rid of the stones and plant everything the same. This man then discovers the creator of permaculture, Bill Mollison from Tasmania. And he says, well, hold on, that's exactly what I'm doing. Bill Mollison comes to visit him and says, how is this possible? How could you be doing this? This is very important in the scientific spirit. We all have the knowledge. There are not certain scientists who have the knowledge. We need to learn how to descend that knowledge to our ego because otherwise we don't see it. Techniques of the new paradigm in order to see where we are stuck in our lives. Our wisdom will tell us what to do. If we go to authorities, if we look to authorities to know what to do, they won't know because they haven't lived our life. What's best than our own wisdom? This man has discovered how if you just throw some, some peas into the ground, the pigs go and dig and save you the work of digging. If you go and see the video, this, this is there. Why don't we teach this in schools now? It's all there. Why don't we teach this? Okay, so now really the last story. I won't go into all these different traits, but hear the difference between what's important and what's essential. I don't have time, but this is so important. What is important is what everybody else says in education. What is essential is what I can define. That liberated me. I haven't decided on the study plan or the curriculum. One day I just walked into the class and said, nobody has told me I cannot educate in what is essential. This was a huge discovery for me in my life. So I started to design techniques that would allow me to use the curriculum in order to do self-growth and even enjoy doing it. So I would place the subjects within the historical context, and that takes away that whole negative charge. 
Look, this is the box I was telling you earlier about the isms. Look at this, scientism versus scientific spirit. Scientism sees the scientist within a box. It doesn't feel. It says, this isn't proven, hasn't been proven, and stops there. Who cares that it hasn't been proven scientifically? Go on. There is scientific spirit there. Look at the image, a grandfather teaching his grandchild. They're touching reality, they're feeling it. First we feel it, and then we talk about how we interpret it. But here we do it the other way, round. We first we interpret it, and then we see if we feel. The scientific spirit feels first, and then says, which is the outlook I will use to look at this? And could it be different? It doesn't lock itself into one option. And here, read what it says here. This is up in the air. The Earth would be this now. What are the characteristics, the traits of the scientific spirit? Why is it so important in order to change paradigms? Realize that this could be a whole weekend course, and this is just like a very short sort of advert about it, so there's no time to go into this further, but I would like to finish with a, a thought, a reflection. Your struggle for what is fair and just in that duality shouldn't stop you from recognizing your dreams, because you can struggle against what is unfair and win, and then something else that is unfair will come in. That is the rule of duality. The way to escape the rules of duality is to have dreams that are not within duality. And those dreams are calling at our doors. We need to change the way we think, our ego, in order to each one of us to recognize, and I'm sure that every single one of you here, have a dream for the new humanity. I'm sure you do. So we need to work on the ego so that it may recognize. The channel is a scientific spirit I was telling you about to communicate our wisdom with the ego. And that channel is like a rainbow. It has different colors. Each one of those colors is an age. This is the wisdom of the ages. I connect this talk in this way with my previous talk, the wisdom of the ages. Now you can see the role it has to play. The scientific spirit connects our wisdom with our ego, and it expresses in these different colors of the ages. Things of the wisdom will not be understood by the ego if it's not from the child's vision or the adolescent vision. This is the connection between the scientific spirit and the wisdom of the ages. I thank you so much for your attention and your presence, and I hope you have very happy meetings with your dreams, because what we need the most is dreams whose guardians are our inner child. Ask your inner child, what's your dream? Because your inner child still believes in Father Christmas. Ask him or her, because he or she is guarding your dreams. Thank you.